emphatic. <laughs> She's noisy. So remember where we were sort of organizing things around this, this computational cognitive model notion and these general components where we have declarative knowledge, which is more or less like what you guys think of as a knowledge graph, although we'll talk about that a little bit more. Procedural knowledge, which is something that this group doesn't really focus on. Uh, perception and motor, that's what we talked about the last time, and I'm going to return to that in a minute. All of these feed into something called working memory, which is sort of the scratch pad for where you are doing your thinking. Last time we met, let's see, how much? Not going backwards. How do I get it backwards? It's not advancing or moving. Oh, yeah, there was something about where the person was placed, I think. Huh? Yeah, let's see. Yeah, and remember where we left off the last time, where we were talking about the integration of perception and the motor system, that it's probably not wise to think about the two separately, that perception and the motor system interact. And I drew your attention to this diagram from NICER, um, which talks about how the actual world is processed through cognition, which directs locomotion and, and action and then perceptual interaction with the world. And I said, this is nice, but one of the big flaws with this picture is that it doesn't acknowledge how your actions change the state of the world. And it doesn't acknowledge how the state of the world is changing all the time. And it's the management of the dynamic properties of the environment that we are really built for, okay? We're not built to look at one thing at a time. We are built to move and, and participate in a dynamic environment. And this dynamism is something that I see you guys juggling with, really having problems with using knowledge graph representations. And so I hope to get to the procedural knowledge piece of what I want to talk about today, although I think it's going to be tough. Okay, so uh, let's talk a little bit about what's in long term memory, and that would be these things right here. First, we'll talk about declarative memory, and hopefully, maybe we can talk a little bit about procedural memory. Um, so we would divide up long term memory into semantic content, which more or less looks like the knowledge graph that you guys are dealing with. Um, we do make a distinction between general semantic knowledge and episodic knowledge, which is the specific instantiation of an instance in your semantic memory. And we'll talk a little bit about that and then maybe procedural knowledge. And I think I moved up, I think I moved up working memory and attention between the two before we got to procedural. Okay, so um, semantic memory. Um, basically follows the physical symbol system hypothesis that Newell articulated, which is that we reason about symbolic knowledge, symbolic representations. And the, one of the points that I really want to make sure we understand here is that this is not the same thing as words. I don't think there's any cognitive scientist anywhere who thinks that the language of thought is literally words. Um, and if you want a, a, a term for that instead, we would probably call it mental ease, and it's some kind of symbolic representation of knowledge. And that takes care of the fact that uh, individual words have multiple meanings. Uh, multiple words can point to the same kind of concept. Um, you can refer to things with pronouns. Uh, you can refer to things indirectly, et cetera, with gist, et cetera. So it's just nobody thinks that this is language. And when you guys talk about large language models as the foundation of cognition, I think it probably really bothers almost every single cognitive scientist because nobody believes that that's the foundation of, of, of cognition. Does it inform cognition? Sure. But it is not the basis of cognition. Um, there is a notion that is relevant to your conceptualization of attention, which is that we can think about pockets of semantic memory being primed or activated by a current context so that when something appears in the environment, 
um, it's going to it's going to alert parts of your semantic knowledge, and that will be activated. And all of the surrounding concepts will also be shut. We would say primed and available to match incoming data. So that's sort of one notion of what you might call endogenous or internal attentional processing. The notion of a graphical representation, at least in cognitive science, goes all the way back to 1969, Collins and Quillian. This is your conventional semantic memory model. It should look like things that you've seen before. Um, the two kinds of links that we have here are is a links or inheritance links and has, has property kinds of links and nothing else at the, at the time. We did a bunch of um, empirical work after that in the 70s, talking about the strength of relationship between the concepts. And there's empirical methods for establishing that. And we've also developed the foundations of multidimensional scaling, tree fitting, and clustering. This goes all the way back to the 1980s, and it's Roger Shepard. And I want to make sure you guys know it's psychologists who did the statistical work that, that grounds all this stuff. Uh, 1975, we started worrying about the representational capacity of these kinds of graphical representations of knowledge. There's a very important paper, Amit has talked about this before. It's William Woods's What's in the Link. Everybody should read that paper. Um, but the issues, the concerns were that knowledge representation has more involved in the links beyond is, as and has parts. And, and Woods goes on to talk about you know, the, the need for other kinds of predicates and other kinds of arguments um, and, and lists a whole bunch of limitations in graphical representations of knowledge. I think you guys should look at that for anybody that's doing knowledge graph work to see the extent to which these complaints um, still uh, apply. Um, one of the complaints I do want to call your attention to is the absence of extensional semantics. What do we mean by extensional semantics? What we mean by extensional semantics is an issue that Amitava, I believe, has been concerned about, which is how do the symbols here map onto the real world? How do you know? What is a fire engine when you see a fire engine in front of you? And that whole question really stresses this, this perceptual piece, which has been sort of partitioned away in the computational cognitive model. But that is a really big concern. And I will illustrate further my concern with that particular issue. Um, another, and I am going fast because I want to try to get through as much of this as I can. Um, another issue that came up in the refinement of these semantic memory models is the notion of categorization and the idea that in a categorization hierarchy, and this is something that you've been concerned with, Deepa, you want to know what abstraction is. So you can think of categorization along multiple levels of abstraction. And Rosh's main contribution is the distinction between a superordinate level of abstraction, a basic level of abstraction, and a subordinate level of abstraction. And the idea is that the basic level features are more or less correlated with each other in a way that the superordinate features are not. In knowledge graph, people are using it differently, right? I, I'm, I'm telling you what cognitive science is. <laughs> <laughs> you might not be as disciplined. In fact, I, in fact, that would be my main complaint about knowledge graphs in general. I, is that I the see the is not formal. I see the subordinate level mm -hmm. abstraction in most of the papers. Okay. And then the basic level. It depends on the application if we are using that. Mm -hmm. That's the difference I know about abstraction which we are using right now. Mm -hmm. Like, I have no background in it. So, well, you know, I, I, 
I am concerned that you don't have good principles to identify this very sort of foundational idea in human categorization, which is that there are different levels of analysis on concepts. And moreover, there is a preferred level of analysis, and that would be called the basic level. So I'm, go I'm not going to say, have a seat on this um, velvet colored covered bench. I'm going to say, take a chair, have a chair, okay? So we reason more or less at the basic level, and you would only reason or specify in language these subordinate level concepts if there was a need, if I wanted someone to sit, if I had a kitchen chair and a living room chair in the same scene, and I wanted somebody to sit in one and not the other, then I might make that distinction. But all things being equal, I'm going to be working at the basic level. Um, Mega, you're looking puzzled. Is that? Uh, I wanted to know, can, can't there be more uh, than three categorizations other than superordinate basic? And yeah, superordinate? yeah. So one of the problems here is that um, it looks like the, the subordinate can unpack even more with expertise. Mm -hmm. So yes, that is certain. You're correct. That is an issue. Dr. Shandin, so it it depends on the application which we are using and type of analysis which we want to do. So that kind of ab abstraction at that time we want to use, right? Yeah, yes, it would be context dependent what you would need. So you know, if I'm a botanist or something, and I'm talking about you know a, a particular kind of white oak tree, you know, I'm I'm and you know, I don't know, some disease or something that it's vulnerable to, I would be very specific for that. But if I'm just talking about going to a picnic and sitting down underneath a tree, I might say, I probably would say, you know, sit, sit down under the under the oak, not sit down under the red oak or the white oak, because that's just not relevant in that particular situation. So the amount of detail that you would provide in a verbal description and the amount of the number of features that you, that would be salient to you would be context dependent, but all things being equal, basic level is where you think generally. Um, there are prototypicality effects in here. So if you look at chair, table, and lamp, you know one of these is more typical than the other, more central than the other. There are response time data that uh, distinguish between reasoning at the subordinate level and the basic level and the subordinate level and uh, reasoning with the exemplars within each of these. But I don't think so that currently people are doing the analysis on the context level. I mean, which people? Whatever uh, paper I have read. Okay, so computer scientists. Yeah. Okay, so I'm talking about cognitive scientists. Okay. <laughs> So, and you know, Savannah and I have had oodles of conversations about this, about the lack of um, formality in the way you're designing the abstraction hierarchies and the way you consider concepts related to each other. Well, this is a lot. Now, I can see the need for some kind of generic knowledge graph, and then maybe you put in your reasoning procedures preferences for how you wander around on that knowledge graph. But this general notion about how people think about the objects in their world is pretty well accepted in science. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to know, for a basic level object, uh, can it have multiple subordinates and multiple superordinates? And are we taking care of that? Oh, is it a graph or a tree is what you're saying? That's one thing. Um, uh, that's a really good question. Um, so, you know, um, this thing, this thing here, or or any of these things down here could be, for example, a weight. Yes. <laughs> or or you could think of the trees as a source of fuel, for example. Right. Yeah, I don't know that Rosh has had ever looked at that kind so, of problem. So the example that I'm thinking of is say, uh, I have the basic level object, chicken. Mm -hmm. I could have the superordinate as, um, animal or bird or food or any of these things yeah you could you i don't think there's anything that precludes a, a 
geographical structure in, in this at all. So that a child could be a member of different basic level right. categories. Okay, um, there's, a, there's some problems with the, the Rosh analysis. So, um, you know, I, I mentioned to you that there's such a thing as a, a typical member at the basic level. Uh, but, you know, if you have um, two different categories like pets and fish, a guppy, just a little tiny fish, is not a typical pet and it's not a typical fish, but it is a typical pet fish. <laughs> okay, so the combination of the of the categorization doesn't work out quite the same, quite the way you'd like. Another problem, uh, which is one that I think is much more serious for you guys, is ad hoc categories. So I can ask you, what are what are the instances of things that you need to take on a trip? And you can provide that for me. Um, and it's not clear that that set of categories already exists in your mind, but we can create them. Um, no symbol grounding, the, prob the problem that we've talked about before, no, no clarity in that representation for how you know that something's a dog, how you know that something's a fish, et cetera. Um, and and um, something that's important to you guys, where the knowledge comes from is not explicit in those representations. So provenance is not something that we have addressed as well as, as I think you would like. Okay. Um, other other notions that I, I want to make very sure that you are aware of. Um, latent semantic analysis, which is an analysis of the relationships between words, which you guys certainly understand. Um, I want you to know that the source of that is Tom Landauer. If we haven't made that clear before, you should. Tom was a psychologist, mathematical psychologist, recent, fairly recently passed away. Many of the terms that you use <laughs> come from Landauer and Dumais, Susan, Susan Dumais. And so it's really important that you know that. And this whole work on the semantics of language really um, is sort of um, localized in Boulder, Colorado, which is why I've asked Amitabha, you know, where, where do some of these people come from? It's Boulder is, Boulder, Colorado is a good source of uh, natural language understanding from a human perspective. Not the only one, but really, really important. Um, okay. Now, I want you to, to look at, at this and the problem of the absence of symbol grounding. If I take out the words in a semantic network and I just put in little numeric references, what does this mean? Like providing an ID to a particular word. Pardon me? ID to particular word. It's not, it's just, that's it. That's all that, there's nothing, when you do an operation on, on this and your knowledge graph, and you're seeing all this meaning in the connection between the nodes and the graph, it doesn't know what those things mean. All the computer knows is that G001 is closely related to G003. Do you see the problem? And you know, G003 is related to G004, which is not quite as related to G001. That's all it's got. Now, is that irrelevant? No, it is directing attention, it is directing reasoning, but there's, there's, that's what we call intentional semantics, meaning the relationship between words in the graph, but no extensional semantics, no um, semantics that point to the things in the world that match the nodes in that graph. Okay, I did that really fast, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> Another kind of knowledge that we have, and by the way, you have to stop at two because Chaturangi needs that. So stop me at two. Okay. Um, another kind of knowledge that, that we talk about that I haven't heard you guys talk about, and I think it kind of gets you tangled up a little bit, is the distinction between general semantic knowledge and episodic knowledge. And episodic knowledge 
refers to specific instantiation of a class. So my dog, your dog, uh, um, the walk that I went on yesterday, a specific instantiation. And, and we talk about that as a type token distinction. I think you guys talk about that in the same way. Um, and we experience instances of a class. Um, but the problem from a psychological perspective is that the instances can challenge inheritance logic, right? So, um, you know, my dog is like dogs, except, oh, by the way, she had surgery, except, by the way, you know, she has a little uh, a shaved patch on her leg because of the IV. So, so you can't necessarily assume that a particular instance inherits every property that is at the higher level of analysis. And so then the question is, well, if that's true, if you can't make that assumption, then what good is it to have the higher level of analysis? You guys see the problem? There's, all, there's always a particular, a potential particular exception. In yeah, I mean, these are the edge cases that you're talking about. We want to generalize. You do, but when Amit talks about personalization, okay. he's talking about this issue. So here we can add the levels of abstraction now. You can, but be careful about inheritance. Yeah, so inheritance comes with the abstraction, right? Yes, but be careful. So what are you going to do? Are you going to look at the instance and enumerate all of the exceptions to that thing? To the, if we the, want to inherit, then we have to enumerate, and that will be a complex. Okay, so what, yeah, that's the problem. So what good does it do you to have all that? It will in, increase the complexity. It will. <laughs> We didn't have solution for that. Okay, well, so this is a, certainly people, you know, psychologists and cognitive scientists worry about this. Um, and then, you know, attached to episodic memory and, and instances would be specific detail about time and place. And although psychologists and cognitive scientists haven't used this to talk about provenance, this might be a place where you would talk about provenance, where you could say, I know this because. I experienced it in this particular context at this particular time, et cetera. Um, now you have to be careful about episodic memory. The details may be unavailable over time uh, and, and it's not clear whether they're really gone or it's just a retrieval problem, uh, but they're very, very subject to suggestion. So if I say to you, uh, how fast did the car smash into the pedestrian, God forbid, <laughs> versus how fast was the car going when it hit the pedestrian? If I ask you in the first place, you're going to say it was going 50 miles an hour. And if I ask you in the second case, you're going to say 10 miles per hour, or that might be exaggerated. But the way in which you ask the question impacts your recollection. Um, this episodic memory is very age sensitive. It declines uh, starting around 60. I certainly experienced this. So you know, many of you might've heard me say, uh, uh, I know I talked about this with somebody, but I don't remember if I talked about it with you. Okay, so what you're seeing there is a decline in episodic memory. Um, this worries me a lot about what you guys are doing. Instances are separable. And we can reason about multiple instances simultaneously. So I am perfectly capable of reasoning about the two separate instances of my dog. I have two of them at the same time. And I have no idea how you guys deal with that kind of problem. Can you, can you tell me about that? I don't know how to say it. So, in my opinion, and I don't know much, but this is just an intuitive guess. Um, separating instances would be, I don't know how we could do it without having them personalized to those instances. Well, that'd be okay. 
open fertilization generally? Is there an app? Depends on, <laughs> depends on like, the application, how much fertilization you can have. But yeah, on instances. So, and I want to read it about it simultaneously. You know, Spike is sitting here, and Candy is sitting over there, and Spike eats this, and Candy eats that, and and when they play together, I, I still want to be, I, I need to be able to represent them as dogs, but separate instances. And so I give that problem to you um, to think about. It. Uh, mixed evidence regarding the role of stress and memorability. So. There is some evidence that if you put me under a whole lot of stress or a moderate amount of stress, um, I might remember the details of a particular situation somewhat better. The evidence is mixed because it might also be the case that I'm just more confident in my recollection, but I'm actually not more accurate. The evidence is kind of mixed. But these are all some features that psychologists and cognitive scientists would worry about regarding episodic memory, and I'm not sure the extent to which you guys are thinking about them in a sort of a knowledge graph sense, and I do think this is kind of the key to personalization. Does anybody want to say what you do about this for knowledge, for knowledge graphs? What, what would you do? Simultaneously, we can extract something which, like, I can say about the brain stuff, like how it is processing, because the same part is involved in simultaneous uh, activity. Mm -hmm. So we can do something like that into knowledge graph. We can. Well, so the brain, you you can represent brain activity. Yeah, in knowledge graph, we can probably like that's what I. I'm guessing that we can do that something like that. Because one region of brain is also responsible for several activities. So we, yeah. can, we can make a type of a knowledge graph which can handle these kinds of several activities simultaneously. Show me. <laughs> I, I want to I see that. I want to see that both in knowledge graphs and I want to see that I can, I can, I can do it in computational models by like using Bayesian probability, but I'm not sure how in knowledge graph. Well, okay. <laughs> and then I also want to see it in large language models. I want to see that the inferences about each one of the separate entities are kept straight in, in a large language model. Inferences can be done with Bayesian models. Sure, but I, but they have to be straight. I want the inferences about Spike to be here and the inferences about candy to be there and they're both dogs so they get some inheritance and they don't have everything about them there but they are separate instances and if i were coming Maybe i need an expert for knowledge graph with, well not just in knowledge graphs but in large language models and so uh -huh. you know the kinds of problems that you were talking about today comparing chat gpt and human generated language I'd be worried about this kind of thing. I'd be worried about the ability to track the inferences of separate instantiations in the same conversation. People can do that for sure. Yes. Show me the chat GPT can. Yes. This is actually a good uh, piece of test that we can use. For yeah. This. yeah. I think there are some messages in the chat. Pardon me? Oh, okay. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but it, but still, Kaushik, the question is, what does it mean to be as needed? And how can you anticipate that in advance? That's the concern. As needed will make it complex because also as also without having the specific information about candy and spike we don't know which dog attributes uh, relate to them so for example you cannot boldly say that all humans have two limbs because some they some don't that's right some don't that's right that's right so it, it looks to me um 
like the episodic memory part can be computationally handled with uh, handled um, through personalization of the knowledge graph that we're trying to use. I'm, I'm not, I don't have the answers about- Personalization will make it very, very complex. Are you getting it now? Of course. Yeah. There is no question about that, but I, I don't see any other way as of now. Well, it's not just me, right? It's not just my knowledge graph about candy that's the relevant thing, right? You you would be perfectly capable of dealing with two different instantiations of a dog that you've never met <laughs> at the same time. One has long hair, one has short hair, one has a broken leg, you know, whatever the deep, you can do that. It's not your personal knowledge. It's just your ability to separate out the properties of the token from the type. You can do that. And that's my point. This is something that humans can do. You show me you can do it. In, and especially, you know, in the same setting, I want the, the inferences about each token to be separable. There's no, and there's never going to be any confusion. In, you know, in humans. Okay. Huh? I don't think so that that is possible for now. Well, okay, so, but, but that's my, my job is to tell you what are the capabilities of human cognition that will press you on how you are representing instances and how you are thinking about challenging chat GPT and some of the issues that we just talked about. Okay, what time is it? I'm, oh, it's not, okay, so, boy, am I motoring fast. I'm sorry, guys, but I'm just really, okay. So remember that picture. This one here. So I've, I've talked to you about declarative memory. We divided it up into semantic and episodic. We just did that now. We've already done the perception and motor piece, right? We haven't done the procedural piece, but I do want to say a little bit about working memory, which you can kind of think of as a scratch pad kind of thing. And as, as we're talking about this, Forrest knows absolutely everything that I'm talking about here. Um, this is uh, Laird's uh, uh, general, what do you call it, common model of cognition oh. thing that we're using. And I'm trying to organize the various pieces there. But so any questions about this? He knows all this stuff. <clears throat> Okay, so there's this sort of working memory scratch pad kind of thing. We think it is, we think of it as a mental representation of content. Remember, I said it is absolutely not words. It's mental concepts, okay? Specific to the current, and that includes external situations. Um, and it is a subset of beliefs about the real world. It's not the real world, it's what the person who's looking at the world thinks about the world. So we need to keep that straight. In general, it's capacity limited, called seven plus or minus two chunks. Um, the scope of a chunk is a function of expertise. So what looks like a chunk to me is probably different than what looks like a chunk to you in terms of, you know, like psychology and cognitive issues. But what looks like a chunk to you in computer science doesn't look like a chunk to me. I went way down into the details. Um, and this is one place where you can think about human attentional capacity. So there's just only so many things that you can deal with in working memory at, at one time. Um, and what's in here is modified in two ways. One is inference. So you check your semantic memory or you, or you perform an, a, a, a thought um, in procedural memory and you infer something and that changes what's in working memory or there's changes in the external environment. Both of those are gonna influence what's in working memory. Influenced by stress, it does look like you, you can you sort of increase the capacity of your working memory with a little bit of stress, uh, but too much stress, it's gonna fall apart. Not enough stress, you know, you're bored and you know, not thinking about things. Um, uh it looks like working memory capacity is strongly related to intelligence 
So when we try to develop intelligence tests and sort of understand what that one main thing is, it looks like people with um, larger working memory capacity have a, a cognitive advantage. Capacities of kinds of age, more good news for me. Uh, and, and one of the points that I want to make about this is I've talked to you about what's in your mental representation of what's going on in the external world, but don't overlook the potential for external material representations, physical representations, diagrams, notes, etc. that even if you are not focusing on them, they are there for you to consult. And uh, you know, even this conversation would be a really good example of that. I obviously prepared these overheads or these slides in advance. Uh, I don't know, I couldn't list off for you right now without looking at the slides, everything that's in those slides, but the slides are available to me to consult as an external resource. And so you really don't wanna be thinking about cognition as just restricted to what is going on between the ears. You wanna think about the role of these external representations in the process. Okay, so we don't have time for this. I really do want you to look at this. I talked to you about attentional processes related to the size and scope of working memory, um, but you're going to get a much bigger sense of what's going, how psychologists and cognitive scientists think about attentional processes. If you look at this video, I'll make it easy for you and just post this link in our class chat. Uh, but in general, attentional processes, search, select, and sustain focus on environmental content. And that can be based on physical properties. So I can look right over there and focus my attention over there. But it's also based on semantic properties. So if something that somebody says right now is related conceptually to what I'm talking about, that will also enter into my awareness. And what concerns me, I think, in the way you guys talk about attention is that it seems to be a spatially constrained concept. So, you know, I'm thinking about this subset of words or this much of words or that much of words. And that's not the way human cognition works. Human cognition is designed particularly to be independent of spatial location so that we can pick up on something that is relevant externally, even if we're not focused in that particular direction. Um, so please have a look at the Posner um, um, video. I think he gives a really nice depiction of attentional processes, both in terms of the working memory issues and what we might call um, endogenous attentional processes and the ability to monitor the environment, what we would call exogenous attentional processes. Is this different from the one which we showed? Yes, this is a different, yeah. I mean, Posner is absolutely your attentional <laughs> process guy, for sure. The um, video that we looked at before was on experimental methods and neuroscience methods and the contribution of neuroscience to cognitive science. And this one is specifically the work that, that Posner has done on attentional like processes. Yeah, cognitive perspective. Okay. Okay. Um, and uh, let's see. Oh, so sequential text, as I just mentioned, is an exceptional environmental source of spatially used or collocated content. That's really not a very good example of allocation of attention to the external environment. Uh, and we have to be, we have to be able to be interruptible by events that occur in the external environment, right? What if a tiger should leap out right behind me? I need to stop whatever it is that I'm doing now and do something about the tiger. So um, the idea that, that, that sort of spatial co-location determines our attentional processes is really very strange to cognitive scientists. Um, there is a role of attentional processes um, in executive function, and that will control inferential processes, including search of memory and task switching. So you can focus on task A at, at one time, task 
be at another time, switch between the two. Dealing with you guys is absolutely an exercise in task switching, right? That's what it's all about. And that's why we look at you blankly when you say, you know, here's the latest result from the experiment that you asked me to do. And we're going like, what? <laughs> what, what, what were we doing? You have to reinstate um, the old task. And there's a, there's a cost to task switching. Um, and, and then there are some notions in attentional processes called engagement and flow. I'm not an expert in this, but there is some kind of a notion that you can become deeply engaged in something and focus your attentional processes and not be very aware of what's going on around you and interested particularly in what it is that you're doing. Um, that's dangerous. If a tiger comes in, you might not notice. Okay, the piece that I was really worried about, what time do I have? Oh, okay. So here, procedural memory, which is the piece that I'm not clear on what you guys do about this. Okay, this potentially corresponds to cognitive computing. System two reasoning lives here. Um, basically, reasoning matches the current situation and working memory to procedural memory it looks for a set of applicable inferences based on the conditions that are explicit in working memory um it is a big search and pattern matching problem right so here you have this working memory with its seven plus or minus two chunks and you've got to go back to to procedural memory and say okay which one of these inferences is the set that i really need to be worrying about um, in general, we kind of think of procedural knowledge as organized by schemas. So it's not just a whole, it's not just a big bath of rules, but it would be, you know, this is the schema that I would use uh, in surgery. And this is the schema that I would use for a birthday party, and et cetera. So that, that's going to cut down on the search space quite a bit if you have the procedural content organized by, um, by semantics. Um, it appears to function as sequential goal-directed inferential knowledge. And the big job that's done here is that it changes the contents of working memory and the state of the real world, potentially. So if you think I'm going to move, the typical example, I'm going to move uh, this block from this position to that position, your working memory gets updated. If you actually execute that change in the real world, the real world gets updated, right? Okay. so. You're, you're changing both working memory and the state of the world. Typically, this is programmed as condition action rules. New assertions become true. So when I pick up the block from here and I move it over here, the block is now here. Old assertions have to be retracted. So this is this sequential reasoning thing and change over time that I think is getting you guys kind of tangled up. And we've certainly worried about this a lot in, in procedural knowledge. Old assertions need to be retracted. So the new, the old, the block is no longer over here. Now over here. There are challenges to conventional logic. There's a whole bunch of names here that I really think you guys need to know. These are classic, good old fashioned AI references. It's just not possible to be a, a a conversant computer scientist without knowing about these things. This is one of them, McCarthy and Hayes, called the frame problem. It's really difficult to identify everything that remains true after the inference. So, okay, so I picked up the block and I moved it here. What what in the situation was still true and what is no longer, it's, it's no longer the case, for example, that this spot where I put the block is uncovered. <laughs> okay, so you have to enumerate every single one of those, and that's hard to do. It's difficult to identify everything that's no longer true, and this whole set of issues is, is often lumped into what we call common sense. Has anybody heard of this before? Yeah, Dr. Shannon, so when you first talked about procedural memory, the thing that came to my mind was uh, cautious work on process knowledge, and I was working if that is a Exactly. Exactly. Another thing that 
that came to me after going through this slide is um, something that uh, uh, language models are trying to do now is chain of thought reasoning. So that is where they are putting these system two kind of reasoning where yeah. you um, you train the model to give a step by step reasoning of specifically in question answering tasks. Mm -hmm. So just instead instead of spitting out the answer, you expect the model to give a chain of thought reasoning of how it derived to that mm -hmm. answer. Mm -hmm. So. I think that is what uh, the language models are now taking care That's of. That's what they're trying to do. Don't forget this. Yes. And yes. Yeah, Don't yeah. forget this problem. Yeah. And you're going to run into that problem. In, in fact, <laughs> I recently read a paper that did both of these things. Like they were doing the search and retrieval problem as well from documents, as well as they introduced chain of thought reasoning. Um, their experiments showed that they did perform way better than the models before. However, there was still a 20% gap between the model's performance and human performance. And what people could do, yeah. So we're still way far off, but heading in that direction. So I, I just, you know, it just seems really strange to me to represent procedural knowledge in a knowledge graph structure. I just, it, it's just not in my head to do it that way. I would represent procedural knowledge, including the stuff that, you know, in diagnostics and mental health diagnostics, it doesn't matter where it is. I would represent all that stuff as condition condition action rule. Um, and I'd be worried about, you know, obviously the search and pattern matching problem. Yeah. Uh, Gopshal and how is it different from, I mean, are there any differences between uh, procedural memory and automated planning? Uh, no. The short answer is no. The, I mean, the, the planning literature and this literature are very much synchronized. I'll make one, one point about that, though that relates kind of to the MAR discussion that we had in terms of levels of analysis. So um, most of the planning stuff that I know about is programmed, you know, sort of like this, these condition action that probably seems familiar to you. There are some people who are concerned that that representation of procedural knowledge is too brittle to manage exceptional conditions. And so instead of representing the procedural knowledge at this level of analysis, they go a higher level up and represent constraints on procedures. And then for any individual situation, you actually calculate out, you compute out from those constraints in combination with the situation that you're in a specific set of condition action rules. So the classic example of this in cognition is human counting. We've done this work in, in um, developmental psychology where if I ask a little kid to count a set of objects, one, two, three, four, five, six, they can do that really well. Ask a kid to, in this set of objects, after a certain age, to have this nth object take on the label of three, okay? It's called the make this one three task, okay? That capability to adapt your condition action rules to the addition of a new unexpected constraint like this is something that little luck kids can't do and bigger kids can do. And so that really demands this higher level of constraint, constraints on the procedure as the foundation. Does this make sense to you? Yeah. So yeah. there is a branch of planning which is called as hierarchical planning. Yes. It's basically yes. the whatever. Sure. Is. Yeah. Uh, the definition there that you have where condition action rules, predicates, and so on, preconditions, it's actually classical planning, mm -hmm. the most basic of the mark. Mm -hmm. And after, uh, I mean, I went through Kaushik's paper as well. I think there's a clear distinction between uh, what is being called procedural knowledge and what actually is hierarchical planning. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't think all the preconditions and the stuff that planning people really pay attention to are being taken care of here. It's basically just a hierarchy. Mm -hmm. Do this step, then do this step, then do right. this step. Uh, apart from that, you are not setting any values to or any values false. If I'm, uh, if I understood Kaushik's work correctly. Well, I, I don't, I, I can't speak to Kaushik's work. I can speak more to the planning work because actually I'm way more worried on the human capacity to plan than I am for almost anything else. That's that's been the central contribution of my of, of my own work, and I, you know, my general comment is this is too brittle to to explain human adaptive capability, and to get away from that, you need 
a an articulation of the constraints on the process and from those constraints and a model of your situation then you can derive the condition action rules but we don't want to be thinking about knowledge at this level right does that make sense to you yeah okay I mean, that's certainly the definition of classical planning, which is brittle as you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, but I think there have been other derivatives such as epistemic, which considers mental model of the self and mental model of other people as well in a multi-agent setting. Yes. Yeah. So you're using SOAR, I, I presume. Yeah. Some kind of SOAR application. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Although I would say, I, I don't, I, you know, I have to look at the latest version of SOAR. When Laird gave this talk, he did not talk about that kind of issue. Um, in there. So I, but the place to look for this issue from the cognitive science side, uh, if you ping me, I will give this to you, but it would be Kurt von Lane, B A N L E H N. Constraint, and it's called constraint based planning, it's really the basic issue. Yeah. yeah oh, I don't know how to get them. Here. What time is it? Five minutes left. Five minutes, okay. Just two more things that are. Yeah. Okay, good, good to know. <laughs> there is a way to get around the frame problem. And Gary Marcus also posted on LinkedIn a lot about the common sense problem. Yeah. He's been posting after the release of GPT-3 a lot. One more. Oh, now we're not in the right place. And I only have five minutes. Okay. Whoops. A couple of other issues. Inference does not simply add on new states. We talked about this. Old states get retracted. That means that you just don't add up stuff. You've got to manage that. That's called von von Sarkman. Everybody in this class ought to know what that is. Uh, and that's um, uh, owed to McDermott and Doyle. And then, and then this is a, an additional tricky problem. I'm not the expert on this, but it just feels to me like you guys don't know about these problems. The removal of old states requires retraction of inferences built on the old state. So if my block was here by my left foot and I move it to my right foot, any inference that I had made about the potential of kicking the block with my left foot, for example, that needs to be gone. And that's a big problem. Um, that problem is called truth maintenance. John Doyle is the person that you would look at for that. Um, and what's happened in, in cognitive science research because of all this stuff is that all of these modeling problems have sort of nudged a lot of the psychological research in, in favor of closed world or toy tasks where you don't have this combinatoric explosion problem and all of these inferential complexities. Um, I don't, I don't, this probably would be one reason why I, I don't do this work anymore. Although having said that, um, I think my background in this work certainly makes it possible for me to understand what you guys are doing. Um, okay, so just in summary, um, I, I gave you two natural language tasks, deductive reasoning and arithmetic toy, uh, arithmetic problems. And I said that we don't want to think about decognition as just natural language processing, that is not going to do the trick. Uh, I told you about the bar levels of analysis on cognitive systems, the computational is sort of the constraint layer, purpose-oriented layer, the algorithmic layer, where you see the sort of step-by-step -step procedure, and then the neuroscience layer. And we talked about the need to, to converge from the bottom up on um, our evidence. Talked about the history of computational cognitive models. <coughs> Excuse me the original stimulus response behaviorist black box approach, which we said was not going to cut it because there were uh, constraints on behavior that were not predicted by relationships between the stimulus and response. Um, I introduced the, the computational cognitive modules to you, the ones that we just went over. Uh, we talked about the problem of the absence of extensional semantics. I gave you Searle to, to uh, look at for that. We talked about epistemology, I think I, yeah, uh, we talked about epistemology, meaning epistemology for what cognitive scientists know, not the general philosophical problems of epistemology. We talked about experimental contrast between performance on subtly different tasks, which is what I was pushing at you on earlier today. 
you want to have a particular theory about the two things that you're comparing and and that that reveals the limitations of one thing and the benefits of another uh, we talked about all measures having theoretical foundations i gave you a strong warning about focus group surveys and clinical instruments at least from a cognitive science perspective they are shaky <laughs> questionable um we talked about the computational cognitive model components. I questioned the assumed separability of perceptual and motor processes from each other in cognition. I said, it's probably a really bad idea. Um, we talked about the psychological roots of semantic representations. I said that we worry about concepts, not words. I think that's very consistent with the way you guys think about things. Um, we talked about some of the representational limits of semantic networks or what you guys call knowledge graphs. Um, we talked a little bit about intentional processes and dynamic environments, um, loosely constrained at best by spatial and temporal um, co-location. And yeah, let's see. And then I moved on to procedural knowledge, where I told you about the frame problem, non-monotonic reasoning, and truth maintenance are probably the most important things for you to take away here. We never got to this. We never got to looking at what I would have liked to have done, which is um, looking at the actual cognitive computational models for doing the arithmetic word problem solving and the deductive reasoning so that you can see how you know there's semantic knowledge and procedural knowledge and working memory and how working memory gets changed as we update those those problems okay that's everything Turn thank you you're welcome uh, is there anything in chat and then we need to switch to chaturanga okay. You can read this. Huh? Okay. Yes. Exactly, Pashik. I mean that was that was my point. There there's a whole lot more here that is is convergent um than than, than you might think. And and you should appreciate that as the reason I can talk to you guys at all. Because everything that I talked about here is stuff that I, well, not everything, but most of this is foundations in graduate school. This is just very common, you know, stuff that all cognitive scientists know. Again, not everything that cognitive scientists know. I every I kept thinking of a well, gosh, I didn't tell about this, or you tell about that. And then, you know, but you know, what, what are you gonna do? Thank you.